Hey everyone, hope you're all doing good and hope you're all safe. A very, very good evening to all those who are uh, here with me and welcome back to Olive Board's lecture series. And this is going to be a lecture series that is directed towards RBA Grade B 2021 preparation. So there might be so many eyebrows raised. Why are we starting for 2021 so early, right? So let me answer this. We've seen that RBA Grade B 2020 uh, was unpredictable in uh, in its own ways, right? So despite all the preparation that we've had, it looked like it was not enough. So to be more uh, prepared for those unprepared situations, it is always better if you are equipping us uh, from the examination point of view early itself. And that is the uh, sole reason for us to come back with this free lectures for all those who are going to give their RBA grade B 2021 examination. And let me give you a gist of what will be covered uh, through this lecture series. So basically, we are going to help you all understand the basic concepts of economic and social issues, which is going to be uh, pretty much helpful for your phase two of the examination. And uh, since the general awareness part of the phase one is also based on the economics and the social issues, it will also help you understand um, your concepts to link with the current affairs. Right. So this is the agenda and this is the lecture one. Uh, every week we are going to have the lecture at the same time that is at 6 p.m. And we will take very few questions. The objective is not to cover as many questions as possible. It is only to understand the concepts. Right. So we'll be keeping the questions at a minimum, say 7 to 10, not exceeding 10. And we'll try to understand each concept in key, uh, detail. So that's about uh, the session here. Let's get started. If you're able to hear my voice, if you can see the PPT very clearly. Let me know by saying a yes in the comment section so that we don't uh, wait for starting the class. Okay, let's begin the class for today. And as I, I told, the agenda is very, very clear because we know that uh, RBA grade B 2020 had so many bouncers and unpredictable questions. Here we are mainly trying to make it easy for you to understand the basic concepts which will help you even in solving any kind of question yourself. So we can't predict the questions, right? So that is definitely impossible for any institute to claim that we can predict all the possible questions or say uh, most of the questions. What we can equip you is with the understanding of the basic concepts that can help you crack any type of question, right? So with this, let's get started. And today's quote is this. There is no traffic jam along the extra mile. Uh, and this is told by Roger Stobash. So it's a very interesting quote because where uh, most of the world is focused uh, on those routine roads that every one of us cross, uh, where there is a heavy traffic jam, where, is, where there is no space uh, for each one of us and where we compete for spaces, we forget to think about those extra miles, which wherein you don't have to go and compete for those spaces, isn't it? Because uh, there are very, very few individuals who go for that extra mile. So we should think and we should have that awareness of that uh, extra mile wherein uh, we have those beautiful uh, roads which are uh, going to give us that space to reach our dreams, right? So it's an amazing quote if you are taking it deep. So with this, let's get started for our lecture series and uh, the very first question for the day. Which of the following are not included in the primary sector of the economy? A. Agriculture, B. Mining, C. Deposits, D. B and C, E, none of the above, right? So now I also want to clarify one thing here uh, before we answer for this question. So why are we going through MCQ's approach so that you would know that the uh, questions that are going to be asked will be on these lines. And it is also going to bring that specificness of the topic rather than uh, having a topic in detail uh, in 360 degrees uh, dimension. This is going to keep it more relevant from the examination point of view, right? Yes. So what is the answer? Which is not included in primary sector of the economy. Yes, there is an answer as deposits here. But let me tell you the correct answer for this question Guys, is E, none of the above because all the three, agriculture, mining, deposits, all of these are included in the primary sector of the economy. So the answer for this is E, none of the above because it is asking for 
which are not included in the primary sector so they are basically four types of sectors and the fourth one which is the quaternary sector that's a new and a recent addition so how can you classify jobs or occupations into four of them let's understand them in a very easy terms primary sector is nothing but those sector which is working with or extraction of natural resources so anything that is dealing with the natural resources you can call this as a primary sector examples are farming mining forestry all of these things are primary sector taking the case of secondary sector it is going to use the uh, products from the primary sector and either it's going to manufacture or construct something out of it right so we have different car manufacturing exam companies for example which will be following under the case of secondary sector going to the tertiary sector this is nothing but a type of industry which mainly is uh, concentrating on services and these services can be uh, varied like the commercial services that are provided by the retail stores we have uh, professional services which are provided by the uh, solicitors we have uh, services educational services by the teachers right that is social service and uh, we have the entertainment services given by restaurants and theaters and also personal services which are given by the uh, different uh, boutiques like the hairdressers and others right so all of these different kinds of services you can classify them into the tertiary sector and uh, last but not the least we need to have an understanding of what is quaternary sector this is a new sector and this is mainly linked to ICT that is the information and communication technology and also with respect to the research right so all those um, which are into R&D which are into ICT you can classify them as the quaternary sector right so these are the basic sectors of industry moving forward which of the following are the features of command economic system a it lacks the potential to generate a surplus b as it is primitive in nature this type of economic system is highly sustainable c due to its small output there is a very little wastage compared to the other three systems d b and c e none of the above so which of the following are the features of a command economic system we have different types of economic systems and we are here understanding which will be the feature of a command economic system right so these are very simple but we need to understand what is a command economic system and how it runs right to answer this question the answer for this um is e guys right so the answer is actually e please note that the correct answer for this question is e why none of the above is talking about command economic system all the three are incorrect with respect to command economic system so remember that all these three statements are talking about traditional economic systems it is not command economic right so if the question was asking about which of the following are the features of a uh, traditional economic system all of them would be correct but it is asking about the features of command which is incorrect let's know about all the different types of economy one is the traditional economy then we have got the command economy the third is the market economy and fourth is the mixed economy so let's know about what is a traditional economy as you can see here traditional is a, uh, economy is an economy which is primitive in nature right so this is not having any level of sophistication as we are seeing currently so it's very primitive and this type of economic system is highly sustainable because it's not going to exploit the resources for example we can uh, imagine the uh, kind of economic system that tribals uh, of andaman and nicobar are uh, currently having right so that's very very primitive because the way they are interacting with the nature it's also very highly sustainable and uh, you can see that they don't uh, talk about generating high output they are going to rely on small output and also there is a very little wastage when you look at the traditional uh, economic systems and their comparison with the other three systems and also they do not have that potential to generate a surplus which is generally aimed and which is going to give thrust for the exports of an economy right so these are the uh, features of traditional economy now let's look, uh, look at the command economic system command here means that it is a 
uh, economic system where will where there's going to be a dominant central authority like that of a government which will have the huge uh, significance in the economic structure like the russian uh, economic system wherein or the chinese economic system where the government role is the maximum and it controls the economic system it is also called as a planned system and the command econ uh, economic system is common in communist societies because government wants to regulate every other sector it wants to distribute the resources so that is why we have a centralized authority in these kind of uh, countries and ideally you see that centralized control covers valuable resources mainly they go for having this kind of a centralized uh, uh, ecosystem because you will see that these countries will have vast number of resources and whenever they want to uh, they are having these uh, valuable resources they will also try about uh, giving these resources to everyone and in such kind of scenario we see that a control becomes important and that is where you see a uh, command economic system has its basis right whenever we have valuable resources like gold or oil there is a need for centralized control that comes up and uh, the people regulate other less important sectors of the economy such as agriculture and such type of an eco ecosystem right yes in some parts you can say venezuela is holding government holds a part of oil resources and in china we have a command economy right and they are very very rigid by the nature itself they are very rigid uh, compared to the other system and they react slowly to change because uh, they are completely centralized right in centralized um, systems the decision making is very slow and this also makes them vulnerable to economic crisis because when we have a crisis uh, situation or an emergency like situation it requires a, a very quick decision making which is going to be lag lacking in the centralized economic system it is not going to work during such kind of crisis or an emergency kind of situation right so this is a command economic system then we are here we are coming to the market economic system by the name itself it is nothing but a concept that is uh, driven by free markets in other words there is going to be little government in interference so here the people are uh, going to have greater uh, command over their economic resources and um, the regulation comes from the people itself and they determine the relationship between the supply and demand and this uh, market economic system is mostly theoretical why because uh, well every economic system will want some kind of interference isn't it there is not going to be any practically any uh, economy which is going to leave all the control to the people so this is completely theoretical but there will be some instance of government regulation um, also even in those uh, market uh, economic systems you will see that the uh, government will come up they will put laws to regulate uh, the trade ensure that it is going to be a fair trade and also see to it that there are no monopolies that are concentrated right so one of the greatest downside is that it gives private ent entities a lot of economic power and they hold um, as they hold a lot of resources uh, with themselves right so it is like the countries of united states of america and other uh, european countries which follow the market economic system and they there you see that the private entities have a lot of economic power and this also translates into political power too right and this is where you will also see the distribution of resources is not equitable so you will see an uh, unequal development happening right which is not taking everyone along and what is the characteristic of a mixed economy by the name itself you will have two of the actors there is going to be government control there is also going to be market participation both in moderation which is the uh, example for this it can be india right so with this let's go for the next question the theory of development promoted by washington consensus also called as neoliberalism argued that globalization would promote both rapid growth as well as convergence in the world economy it was prescribed into the following years a 1989 b 1988 c 1990 b 1991 e 1985 so in which year was washington consensus um, did it come up come up with right the year in which it came up what is the year in which we have seen washington consensus so this is a very close uh, uh, years here so there is every chance of getting confused remember the answer for this question is 1989 so washington consensus was achieved in the year 1989 just before 1990 right and what does this aim to promote as you can see from the question itself it called in for neoliberalism 
where uh, it gave a strong thrust to globalization too and it had two important um, reasons for going for globalization one is it said that it is going to promote rapid growth at the same time it is also leading to convergence and what is this convergence wherein you will see that uh, all the countries of the world they will have lesser disparities basically convergence is a point wherein you will have every country uh, close to each other with respect to the economic footing that is what the washington consensus was aimed to believe right so world bank proposed so this washington consensus is very important remember that this is an uh, consensus that was achieved by a, a group of bodies which were having their headquarters in washington and that is the reason it got its name as washington consensus so which were the entities that were involved one was the world bank the other is the imf and also the next is the united states so these three us government all of them together have come up with this washington consensus and um, they introduced the structural adjustments to poorly performing economies and it included a 10 policy instrument remember the person who has come up with this washington consensus it is john williamson sometimes we also can expect very static questions like this which will uh, have their place in the examination we are all trying to equip ourselves best right so the answer uh, for this question was 1989 remember the year and what are the 10 points that it spoke about initially it began for uh, certain latin american countries and then it was expanded to the entire world so it uh, proposed for 10 points one is fiscal discipline the other was reordering the public expenditure priorities it spoke about tax reform liberalizing the interest rate a competitive exchange rate trade liberalization liberalization of inward uh, foreign direct investment privatization deregulation and property rights so these were the 10 thrust areas of washington consensus john williamson was the father of it and 1989 is the year and three entities were involved world bank imf and united states administration moving forward which of the following type of reference period is used by rangarajan committee of poverty estimation which is the recent committee with respect to poverty estimation we have had so many committees uh, which have undertaken the poverty estimation in india and rangarajan is the latest one so which is the type of reference period that rangarajan committee uses a uniform resource period b mixed reference period c modified mixed reference period d modified uniform reference period and e none of the above great job guys yes the answer is c modified mixed reference period so this is what uh, rangarajan committee follows mmrp so remember that there are three types of uh, reference period as of now which uh, are used for estimating poverty one is the uniform the other is mixed reference and the third one is the uh, modified mixed reference period there is nothing called as modified uniform reference uh, resource period right so let's know about all of these now so what are these whatever we saw uniform resource period mixed reference period and mmrp all of them are nothing but data collection methods which help us estimate the poverty so what is uniform resource period so this was a uh, data collection method that was followed up uh, until the 1993 to 1994 after that we left this and we moved towards mixed reference period so what is uniform resource the poverty line was based on this data which involved asking people about their consumption ex expenditure across a 30 day recall period right so all uh, the people all the items that the people consume for the last 30 days uh, was asked to be recalled and uh, based on this information this urp is um, collecting the data right so this is a uniform resource period because here every item has a uniform uh, recall period of 30 days right be it uh, say the services be it uh, spending on uh, other durables everything was having only the same recall period of 30 days that is the reason it was called as uniform resource period then from 1999 onwards we moved to mixed reference period so the nsso that is the national statistical uh, organization switched to mrp method which measures the consumption of five low frequency items that is clothing footwear durables education and institutional health expenditure over the previous year and all other items over the previous 30 days so it categorized into two segments one segment which is low frequency items like the uh, 
clothing footwear education and health expenditure they asked they were people were asked to recollect the expenditure that they have spent over the past uh, entire year for these low frequency items and for those other items like spending on food say and spending on entertainment all of these were collected in the past 30 days period so it was using two different periods one is the one year period another is the 30 days period right so that is why it was called as the mixed reference period now what is this the third type that is the modified mixed reference period so instead of mrp uh, the you have seen that uh, the rangarajan committee of poverty estimation has gone for m m m r p here the items are classified into three types one is 365 day reference uh, or recollection period other is a seven day recollection period another is the 30 day so which of them uh, are asked to be uh, recalled within the 365 days that is the uh, low frequency items that is the clothing footwear educational institutional medical care and the durable goods so these are the items that we do not purchase very often that is the reason we have a 365 day recall period for these kind of items then a seven day recall period was given for items that are purchased on a very very regular basis like the uh, eater eatables the edible oil egg fish meat vegetables fruits spices refreshments processed food pan tobacco and intoxicant all of these were given a seven day recall period and then other remaining food items fuel light miscellaneous goods and services rent taxes all of the other remaining items were given a 30 day recall period other than what were there in 365 days and seven days recall periods the others were categorized into 30 day recall period so this is mmrp so we are uh, using this uh, data collection method because this is more specific when you compare it with the other reference periods right so moving ahead next question a curve that shows the relationship between tax rate and amount of tax revenue collected by the governments what is it a phillips curve b laffer curve c lawrence curve and d none of the above so which is that curve which will give us the relationship between the tax rate and the amount of tax revenue uh, finally that the governments are able to collect it's a very simple and straightforward question. The only reason for me to ask this question is to help you understand the different types of curves that are generally asked in the examination. So, which is this curve? It is Lorentz curve. Sorry, this is the Laffer curve, right? The answer for this question is B, Laffer curve. Wherein you have the relationship between the tax rate that is fixed in the economy and based on this tax rate, how much is the tax revenue that is collected by the governments let's quickly uh, run through all uh, the important curves laffer curve as we have seen it talks about the relationship between the tax uh, rate and the total tax revenue collected as you can see in this curve according to laffer curve we have uh, when the tax rates are increasing the tax revenues are also increasing so when you can see that uh, at t1 tax rate it was R1 revenue and at T2 tax rate, we have R2 revenue, which is increasing. R2 is greater than R1. But beyond the point when taxes are increased, you will see that the total tax revenue is going to decrease, right? This is the same case that we are facing with the corporate taxes. Imagine India has got uh, one of the highest uh, corporate taxes rate in the world. And that is the reason we also see a huge evasion that is uh, following in India, right? That is because whenever it is exceeding a certain limit, there's a behavior that we see that the total tax revenue collected comes down. Next is the Phillips curve. And what is this Phillips, Phillips curve? It talks about uh, two parameters. One is the unemployment rate and other is the inflation rate, right? So generally we believe that at high inflation, the uh, unemployment is going to be low. Can you see that the curve suggests the same? So whenever an uh, economy is experiencing high inflation you will see that it will be accompanied by low unemployment rates right you can see that uh, this is a pattern that it follows but there is one situation in the economy which is going to defy this phillips curves and that is called as stagflation wherein you see that the inflation is also high and the unemployment is also high and that is called as stagflation and this is a point which is going to defy the phillips curve right and next curve is the Kuznets curve. This is also one of the important curves. And it gives us a relationship between the per capita income of the country and the income inequality. If you look at the 
uh, developing economies like india you will see that uh, both of them are directly proportional to each other that is the per capita uh, income is also increasing the income inequality is also increasing uh, whenever the overall per capita income of the developing countries are increasing you will see it is accompanied parallelly with a rising inequality but there comes a turning point in income after which whenever the income is increasing that the per capita income is increasing you will see that the inequality will come down and this is experienced by the developed economies right so that is the same reason even the economic survey of 2021 spoke about uh, uh, the importance of increasing the size of the pie because now being a developing economy our uh, idea should be in increasing the size of the pie and that is increasing the per capita income and over a period of time it is going to we will have resources and time to think about the distribution to uh, the different sections and thus reducing the in inequality right and the other important curve is the lorentz curve as you can see lorentz curve is also giving us the line of equality here so it is basically giving us the relationship between two things one is cumulative percentage of the population and the portion of income they are holding so here it is per capita income and income inequality and lorentz curve is talking about cumulative percentage of the population how much percentage of the population are holding how much of income right it gives us the idea of uh, the percentage of population holding the uh, total income of the nation so we know that uh, there are several reports uh, which talk about very little uh, percentage of the population say 1% of the percentage of the total population hold uh, more than 50 or 80 percentage of the entire income right that shows that the economies in the world are having a great deviance from the line of equality right going to the next question gdp is prepared by which of the following a national accounts division cso b economic statistic uh, division cso c social statistics division cso d survey design and research division nsso and e none of the above so which is the division and which is the body that gives us the gdp prepared the answer is a it is the national accounts division of the central statistics organization that gives us the gdp estimates right the answer is a so let's know quick facts about uh, the different divisions which are there in cso remember that there are five important divisions in cso and the uh, cso stands for central statistical organization which was set up in the year 1951 so remember the years which can also be important for us 1951 is when it has come up and it is working under the ministry of statistics and program implementation so this is very important uh, body because it coordinates the statistical activities in the country and also it is the body which gives us the uh, standards with respect to different statistics right so two important divisions that we can take up here Uh, from the CSO are the National Accounts Division and the Economic Statistics Division. If you take the case of the National Accounts Division, this division is responsible for preparation of national accounts, which includes the GDP, the government um, final consumption expenditure, fixed capital formation, and other macroeconomic aggregates. Right, and it also brings out an annual publication which is titled as National Account Statistics. So these are all uh, the the outcomes of the National Accounts Division of CSO. Remember that the GDP, the fixed capital form uh, formation, that is the investment, and we have the government uh, final consumption expenditure. All of these being prepared by National Accounts Division. If you take the case of the Economic Statistics uh, Division of CSO again, it conducts economic census. and annual survey of industries please remember this and it is the one which uh, compiles the iip or the index of industrial pro uh, production it compiles the energy statistics infrastructure statistics and it also develops classification like national industrial classification and national product classification right so these are all the responsibilities of economic statistics division moving for the last question of the day the nsso merged with the cso to form the national statistics office in which of the following years so the national sample survey office got merged with cso we know this and uh, when did this happen 
डिविजन दैट आर वर्किंग इवन बिफोर वी सी देर मर्जर यूर सो वी हैव सम इंपॉर्टेंट ऑर्गनाइजेशन विच आर वर्किंग अंडर दी मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ स्टैटिस्टिक्स एंड प्रोग्राम इम्प्लीमेंटेशन वी हैव दी एन एस एस ओ एंड ऑल्सो दी सी एस ओ इफ यू टेक द केस ऑफ एन एस एस ओ देर आर फोर डिविजन लाइक द फील्ड ऑपरेशन डिविजन द सर्वे डिजाइन रिसर्च डिविजन द डेटा प्रोसेसिंग coordination and publication division in cso as you can see it's there there is a national accounts division industrial statistics division miscellaneous statistics social statistics and here industrial statistics is nothing but economic statistics division is also called as economic statistics division and you have the training and the international coordination division so these are the five divisions now you will see that both of them are merged the government has decided to merge the nsso and the cso uh into one single body that is the national statistics office in the year 2019 right this is very very important uh because the need for restructuring has been felt long back because it is going to streamline and strengthen the uh present nodal functions of the ministry and it is also going to give that synergy whenever we see that there are uh, two bodies doing some similar functions there is a uh, chance for uh coordination issues right so it's always better when we streamline them together and here that is the main reason for uh, bringing them and merging them together into one office that is nso and remember that uh, after this merger this nso will be a body that is going to be headed by the secretary secretary of statistics and programming program implementation so who is going to head the national statistics office it is the secretary of statistics and program implementation so there are several concerns that are being raised that nsso uh, is going to lose its autonomy and independence but this was a uh, a move that was uh, long overdue we can say right so these are, that that's it for today guys hope this was beneficial and uh, please let us know if you have some basic concepts which you are lacking clarity and which we you want us to take up and discuss please feel free to write those topics in the comment section so that we can uh, incorporate those topics and make it more and more relevant for you the only idea is that right thank you so much um please note that at all about we have got Uh, comprehensive courses that is going to help your RBA Grade B twenty twenty one preparation. We have full and mock test, sectional test, topic wise test, and we are also completely updated with the changed syllabus. Right? Thank you so much, guys. If you found the video useful, hit the like button and uh, subscribe to All Abroad to be in touch with all the regular updates that we share with respect to the regulatory body examination preparation process. And have a great learning experience. Thank you so much, guys.